Hello, welcome to another Talk Wildlife interview. And today I have with me Dr. Josef Tavares from the Vulture Conservation Foundation. Uh, Jose is one of the founders and we're gonna talk about predominantly conservation of vultures in Europe. So hello Josef, how are you? Thank you very much. Uh, I'm, I'm fine, thank you. Thank you, Alan, for uh, your invitation and for your interest in vultures and, uh, and our work. Uh, and I hope you are well, and I also hope that all our listeners are, are well in these uh, rather difficult times of COVID pandemic and so on. Yeah, yeah, it, it is a bit weird at the moment, but uh, we'll, we'll pass over that. <laughs> um, so, what I want to do is just to set the scene, I just want to sort of talk about vultures in general, because I think anybody that's sort of interested in conservation or birds will know that vultures are having a really tough time internationally at the moment. Um, so if we start off, let's just put into context, how many vulture species are there in the world? Um, and what's their spread around the world? So what does that look like? Yeah. Good. Well, so vultures are um, an amazing group of birds. First of all, of course, uh, I'm suspect because I work for the Vulture Conservation Foundation, but they are really an amazing uh, uh, group of species. There are 23 species of vultures worldwide, uh, and they, they range far and wide uh, across uh, most continents except uh, uh, Antarctica um, and uh, Australia. Uh, so the vultures live in, in the Americas, North and South America, Europe, Asia, and, and Africa. There's a, a, very, a very big difference between what we call new world vultures and old world vultures. Uh, in fact, they are not really um, similar. They are from different families. Um, uh, and it is really what we call a case of, of convergent evolution. These are co quite different, um, different families of birds that adapted to explore the same niche, the same habitat, the same food source, which in the case of vultures is dead meat. And therefore, um, they became quite similar in ecology and, 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 and in shape. But new world vultures uh, are very different from old world vultures. Uh, one, one obvious difference, for example, is that new world vultures detect um, dead meat, the, the carcasses of, of animals, by smell. Many of, many of the new world vultures, tur the turkey vulture, the American black vulture, some of the condors, the Californian condor, the Andean condor, actually use smell. Uh, to, to detect uh, dead animals. Uh, old world vultures, so the European vultures, the African vultures, the Asian vultures, uh, do, not, do, not have got, do not have a, a, a developed sense of smell and they mostly use sight um, uh, to, to detect um, uh, carcasses and, and dead animals. So, um, so two different families, uh, 23 species worldwide. Yes, it is true that uh, in general vultures are not doing very well. Um, they are not doing very well. So the New World vultures, they're not doing very well. Many species, they're not doing very well in, uh, in the Americas, particularly the, the larger species. I think most people know about the plight of the of the Californian condor, one, one species that was on the brink of extinction, still is in the brink of extinction, almost disappeared. And, for, and the Andean condor is also going down the drain, is, is declining um, very rapidly across the, the, uh, the Andean mountain chain that runs across the whole of South America. Uh, in Africa and Asia, vultures are, are, are doing terribly. Uh, in Asia, they've almost disappeared. There was a, an, an abrupt uh, and dramatic decline of vultures in Asia, uh, particularly in the Indian subcontinent, so Pakistan, Bangladesh, India, um, uh, where, where vulture populations that once upon a time were extremely abundant, um, you know, tens of millions of vultures steaming above Indian towns and, and, and the countryside, uh, at the decline of over 99%, and they become extremely rare species, almost on the brink of extinction because of a veterinary drug called diclofenac. But there, uh, the situation is very dire, um, uh, and uh, uh, we, you know, the, the, those species become very rare. And now more recently in Africa, um, uh, the African vulture species uh, have also become quite rare um, uh, and are declining extremely fast. Uh, there, because of a widespread 
poisoning issue. Um, vultures became the collateral victims uh, of, uh, um, a, you know, a po the poaching, the, the rampant poaching that exists uh, in, in, in Africa on uh, rhino and, and, and elephant for, for ivory, and also because of the human wildlife conflict that exists in Africa, in which uh, local people want to protect their cattle from predators like lions, like cheetah, like leopards, like hyena, and therefore they uh, poison uh, carcasses to kill those predators and uh, instead uh, most of the time kill uh, dozens, hundreds of, um, uh, of, of vultures. So much so that uh, seven of the 13 species of African vultures are now classified by IUCN, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, as endangered or critically endangered at, uh, global, um, at global level. And we are seeing a massive decline of vultures in Africa, places, um, national parks like the Serengeti, the Masai Mara, which uh, in the past uh, harbored um, uh, many vulture species and you know, the quintessential African scene of a lion kill providing a carcass for lots of vultures circling above is becoming extremely rare. And the vultures there are, um, are, are today uh, you know, really uh, depleted. And in some countries have, have almost completely disappeared. Nigeria, for example, you can spend months in Nigeria and you don't see one vulture, uh, one, uh, one single vulture. Um, so the situation there is quite, um, is quite dire. Europe, um, uh, Europe has got four vulture species and we'll talk about them in a minute. What I think we'll do, yeah, I think we'll, we'll, we'll share screen now um, just so that we can talk about yeah, but what what I wanted to know, what I wanted to say uh, before we we go to these four, four vulture species, uh, is that um, uh, the situation in Europe is really the um, uh, you know the, the 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 only one where where vultures are doing relatively well. Uh, it's the only good news story in an otherwise dramatic uh, dramatic uh, um, scene. So, you know, as mentioned, in Americas, they're going down the drain. In Asia, they have almost completely disappeared. In Africa, we, we are, uh, we have got an African vulture crisis. Uh, Europe is indeed the only continent in, in the world where vulture populations uh, have increased for most um, for, for 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 uh, most species, where their range has recovered, um, where their 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 population densities uh, are now reaching historical maximums. It's 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 a mystery of of success of conservation success. It's a a, 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 a mystery of of you know conservation optimism, and um, and and it's very much a, a badly needed uh, message and and an example that shows that it is possible to revert the decline of species. Um, we can, uh, we can uh, um, get species back from the brink of extinction. We can recover their populations. We can reintroduce them. Um, uh, and it's uh, in many ways, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, the light in the end of the tunnel for an otherwise global uh, um, scene on, on vultures, which is quite, uh, quite negative. As mentioned, Europe has got four vulture species, uh, and uh, all these vulture species are doing quite well in Europe. They are they're increasing, they are recovering. I maybe I will just quickly describe them and, and talk about each one of them if um, if, uh, if if I may. The one that you've got in the screen uh, is you know. Uh, for us, the, the, the very special one. In fact, it, it is because of these species that the, the VCF, the Vulture Conservation Foundation, the organization I work for, uh, came to existence. Um, this is our flagship species. It was our first project. It was why uh, we were established, was to, um, to basically reintroduce this species that you have got in the screen now, the birded vulture, formerly co called the Lamagaya, uh, into, into the Alps. It's a... Uh, it's a unique vulture. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a beautiful vulture. In, in, the, in the picture there, you see an adult uh, with, that, with that red ring around the eye. If you, if, you, if you ever look closely into an adult birded vulture eye once, you'll never forget. It's, it's a, a, a fantastic uh, you know, sight. Uh, it's quite unique because this bird, um, where adults, adults in particular, they, they eat mostly bones. 
So uh, alternative names for the species in many other languages, in Spanish or in uh, in French, uh, is called uh, they, they are called birded vulture because they've got those feathers by the beak, uh, which which resemble a little a little beard. But um, uh, they are also called, for example, in Spanish or in some areas in France, uh, bone breakers, quebranta huesos in Spanish, or casser d'eau in some regions of France. So the bone breakers, because they eat mostly bones. 80% of their diet is bones. Um, they can digest uh, entire bones. They, they then uh, digest the, um, the bone marrow, which is extremely you know, nutritious. Um, and therefore, they, 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 they survive on... Uh, um, on bones. It is a, a, a usually a high mountain species, lives in, in, in mountains and, and uh, as mentioned feeds on um, uh, uh, the bones of animals that are killed uh, either through avalanches or through uh, falls in, in cliffs and, and, and so on and, and then they, they feed on, on the bones. The bones, the, the, the marrow, the bone marrow keeps uh, its nutritious value for a couple of years after the animal is dead. So even when everything disappears and when the bone is, is only you know, a dry piece of bone, apparently, inside the bone, there's still quite a lot of, of, of you know, nutrients that, that these um, birded vultures can, can ingest and, and, uh, and, and, and feed on. This species almost disappeared from Europe. It's a species that occurs in, um, in, in Eurasia, so from Iberian Peninsula all the way to Mongolia, and then a, a different subspecies in the mountains of Africa, which these days is total is, is very very rare. Um, uh, really, only occurs in any in any good numbers in two countries, Ethiopia and South Africa, and even there is is declining fast. Um, but uh, in in Europe, in particular, it almost disappeared. Uh, it survived only in three places. Uh, two very small island populations in Corsica and Crete, and uh, um, uh, a few, about 40 pairs, 90, 80 in the Pyrenees. And it disappeared from, uh, elsewhere, uh, from elsewhere. It disappeared from all the other mountain ranges in Europe, from the, all the mountain ranges in Iberia. It disappeared from the Alps, from the Apennines, from the mountains in the Balkans. Um, and disappeared because of, of course, human action. Um, uh, people um, didn't like uh, or thought that the birded vulture was an eagle. The people didn't like eagles, uh, and therefore they would persecute them directly. They would shoot them. Uh, the the same conflict that today still exists: human wildlife uh, people, uh, livestock um, livestock breeders, worried about the fact that wolves and foxes and jackals uh, and bears would prey on their cattle, would put a lot of poison, which would then kill these and other vultures. And, and also there was at some point uh, very little food in the sense that most wild prey in the mountains were almost hunted to extinction. Ibex, chamois and all that uh, once upon a time were extremely rare in, 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 the, European, in the European mountains. So it, it almost disappeared. Um, it was, uh, 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 as I said, you know, only possible to find them only about 40, 40 years ago. It was only possible to find them in, in continental Europe, in the Pyrenees and very few. Uh, and, and about 30 years ago, um, a group of visionaries uh, then decided to uh, to change this and to reintroduce these species back to the wild. And therefore they established uh, the foundation I work for, uh, initially with, on, with, with, with this objective, which is uh, initially to bring these species back to the Alps. Um, and therefore this species is very special to us um, and, and unique. It's, uh, it, it, it was at, at um, you know, at, at the forefront of, of, of the establishment of, of the VCF. It's our flagship species and it's a species that we still work on um, very intensively uh, in the Alps, but, but elsewhere. And I'll come back to, to our work uh, in a minute. But let me go through the other species of vultures that we have in Europe. I will. Before we do, though, just because we will talk about your work as, as well in a minute. Um, yeah. You mentioned there about um, sort of prey species, about, you know, the, Various different species that were, um, you know, had reduced in numbers in the likes of the Alps and the Pyrenees. So now that you've reintroduced the bearded vulture there, is there now enough of those prey items to actually sustain them and to sustain the population that you put in there? Yes, indeed. Um, uh, we um, we. Uh, um, <sighs> 
uh, well, we aim for uh, populations which are self-sustainable um, and in which do not depend on supplementary uh, feeding sites that are supported by humans. Uh, we use a lot of supplementary feeding sites as a conservation tool in many of our projects. Very often it is necessary in the first stages of a reintroduction or conservation project to provide that help to vultures. But our ultimate aim is to have self-sustainable populations in which birds can find natural food and this natural food might be from wild origin, like the, the you know the, the carcasses of chamois or ibex, or can be from domestic origin, the carcasses of cattle that normally dies in the countryside. Um, but uh, in the case of the the, the birded vulture, indeed, uh, today uh, the densities of, of wild ungulates, uh, particularly chamois and and wild ibex that live in the Alps, um, uh, are such that they they, they sustain uh, or they can sustain in very healthy populations of, um, uh, of, of birded vultures and, and hence our reintroduction. When we reintroduce this species or any other species, because we, after reintroducing the birded vulture, we also started to reintroduce other species. Um, uh, maybe we'll speak about it a little bit later on. But before we reintroduce um, any species in the wild, we, uh, we do a very thorough, uh, thorough feasibility study. Yeah, reintroduction, reintroduction projects are not easy and they are expensive. And therefore we have to make absolutely sure that all the conditions are there uh, for us to, 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 to be successful. We don't reintroduce birds for them to get killed or for them then to starve. So uh, we there is um, a number of criteria. We have to, to thoroughly analyze, first of all, if the threat factors that, that led to their demise and disappearance are there. If they are there, we are not going to, to release birds because uh, these birds would then be killed, first of all. And then the second thing is that we need to make sure that the habitat, both for breeding, but also for, for foraging and food, is there and can provide food for those birds. And that was our conclusion in the Alps. Um, uh, the Alps, over the last 40 to 50, 60 years, they uh, they have re you know renaturalized the you know that the, there's a, this phenomenon of rewilding, not only of the Alps but quite a lot of of the European habitats, uh, um, uh, and and the densities of of chamois and ibex in the Alps have expanded. There were actually quite a lot of reintroduction projects of chamois and ibex themselves that that uh, expanded their distribution to all the corners of the Alps. So there's plenty of food. There's plenty of food in the Alps for um, for the, uh, the 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 birded vulture, um, and the proof of that is that uh, we started our reintroduction project, um, which has, has been extremely successful. It's one of the best wildlife comeback stories of our times. The population is increasing uh, very in a very healthy uh, way, um, uh, almost exponentially, uh, simply because when the threat factors that once led it to extinction have been uh, really controlled and mitigated and their survival is very high and two they find plenty of food uh, and because they find plenty of food then they can reproduce they, they they breed naturally very well and the breeding productivity and the breeding success of the birded vulture in the alps is is extremely high much higher than in other regions um, and therefore they thrive um, and and the population is, uh, is is still growing but very important indeed to look into all these aspects when 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 uh, plans a reintroduction uh, of of a vulture species or, or on that of that you know on that matter of, of any species. Yeah, and I'm glad you you mentioned what you did about the project. Um, the project is legendary. It's it's a sort of a, a model of excellence in conservation reintroduction, um, and the, there's some great footage of it on uh, your website and uh, your YouTube channel, which I'll put a link to. Um, so congratulations for that to you and your colleagues because it has been amazingly successful. And you know, it's it's a really fantastic charismatic bird. So for people to people can relate to that because it's a charismatic bird. Um, so congratulations on that project because it, it was amazing. Yes, I mean, in, in fact, I, I, I thank you, for, thank you for this, and and uh, it, it is true, it is true. I mean, particularly the, the reintroduction of the birded vulture um, uh, has been what what the French call very often uh, a projet fédérateur. This is a project that actually gathers. Uh, the the uh, ambitions, the imagination, and uh, the agendas of many different stakeholders around around the species, and through this through this reintroduction and through this 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 flagship species, we actually have been able to 
address uh, a number of very important conservation issues in, 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 in these regions um, that would be very difficult to, uh, to tackle. I mean, in other words, um, for example, wolf, uh, wolf uh, um, reintroduction or wolf uh, conservation is extremely uh, contentious. Uh, and, uh, you know, he, he, because of course, there's this issue of human wildlife conflict around wolves. Uh, farmers, hunters, and a large part of, of, of human society, unfortunately, still has got a lot of reservations uh, about the wolf. And uh, you talk you talk about wolves and, and enough of the room gets cross or, or leaves simply because, um, and, and, and very often actually there's no, no possibility of dialogue because of these uh, tensions uh, and these perceptions. With a birded vulture that doesn't, doesn't happen. You know, you talk birded vulture, and you get you get you get all these people around you. Uh, you you get the the livestock the livestock farmers. You get the hunters. You get the conservationists. You get the tourism developers. You get the local authorities. And this has really helped push quite a number of important conservation agendas in you know in alpine or mountain conservation that otherwise would not be possible if you didn't really have one a charismatic species to a neutral species, and then a project that has really been very successful um, and produced results. Uh, and that is also very, very important is, uh, you know, this, um, uh, these examples of projects that work, that actually make the difference on the ground, that revert the species, that reintroduce the species, uh, you know, so that you can show, okay, look, you know, it's possible. We can revert the decline of biodiversity, uh, you know, if, if we are serious about it, it is possible in one, ex one such example example is with the birded vulture rather than the usual doom and gloom of oh we are lost oh uh, you know everything is negative oh you know uh, another species going extinct which may be very well true because we are facing a biodiversity crisis but after a while starts to um, uh, tire uh, the, the the general audiences, you know, there you know, there it comes again uh, with the same uh, with, with the same story of, uh, of 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 doom and gloom, and having some positive stories is extremely important. And the birded vulture is one such uh, one such story, one that we can show to people to say, look, you know, with a little bit of effort, we can actually save the tiger, we can save the you know the the cheetah, we can save the birded vulture, um, uh, uh, and that is extremely important. Absolutely, well said. So we'll move on to the next one that's uh, European. Yes, so the second species of European vulture is the Cinereus vulture. This is actually the largest of all the four species in terms of wingspan. It's even larger than the birded vulture, you know, the wingspan of about three, three meters. Um, it's a species um, uh, that, again, once, once upon a time, uh, it's an Eurasian species that lives in Eurasia, you know, from, from Iberian Peninsula all the way to Mongolia. Um, and it was a species that in Europe, again, uh, was extremely rare uh, only about 40 years ago. There were only maybe about 250 pairs of these species in Europe in only two countries. Uh, they, they got extinct everywhere. Uh, they, they were only left in Spain. And, and then a very small colony uh, in the Balkans, in Greece, in, in, in Dadia forest. Um, again, um, uh, the, the, the species has recovered. Uh, it has recolonized Portugal. Uh, it, uh, it was reintroduced successfully in France, where now there are at least 35 breeding pairs of, of these species. Um, it, is, it has flourished in, in Spain uh, from 250 pairs in Spain. Uh, there's now over 3,000 pairs of, of these species in Spain. Um, and we are now reintroducing it um, to, uh, to Bulgaria, uh, back to the Balkans. Um, again, uh, to try to restore the former range, historical range of, uh, of these species. So again, a, a good story, a story, I mean, the species is, is today far, uh, far more common and widespread than only 30 or 40 years ago. Um, you, you, you may find this, it, it's, it's mostly a, a Mediterranean species, uh, you, you mostly find it flying above the Spanish or the Portuguese, the Hezas, uh, or in the mountains of southern France, uh, relatively close to the Mediterranean, where the species finds um, 
uh, carcasses. Um, let me just uh, uh, convey another message. So, um, you know, reintroducing, I, I mean, you, I've already spoken about the reintroduction of birded vultures. I, I'm not speaking about the reintroduction of, of scenarios vultures. And this is very much the work we do. Um, I mean, we do, we do lots of different work with vultures, conservation, um, communication, policy and advocacy. But one of our you know, uh, uh, specialities, if you want, uh, ex expert areas is indeed on reintroduction um, uh, to, to to bring the species back to to, to former uh, to former areas. Now, reintroduction can be done um, using two different methods, uh, and and in fact, birded vulture and scenarius vulture. Uh, uh, illustrate well these two different methods. The, the two different methods is reintroducing animals which are captive bred. Uh, or introducing birds that have got a, a wild origin. Uh, and with the birded vulture, we do captive breeding and then reintrodu we reintroduce the birds that, do, uh, that, that come from captive breeding. With scenarios vultures, we mostly reintroduce birds that have got a wild origin. Uh, do not worry, we never ever catch birds in the wild to reintroduce or translocate them uh, to another place. Uh, we don't do that because, you know, there are impacts on the source population, you know, uh, 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 what we do, though, is uh, we can use birds that enter rehabilitation, uh, wildlife hospitals, the, the so-called wildlife hospitals. So um, with the, 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 the population of scenarios vulture, but also with the griffin vulture that we will talk in a minute, the populations in Spain and in Portugal and in France have increased so much that the number of birds that uh, are found by the members of the public injured or weakened um, has increased a lot. Uh, these birds are then channeled to wildlife rehabilitation centers. And normally they would be re-released if indeed the rehabilitation is successful, they would be re-released uh, you know, in Portugal, Spain or France. What we have managed to do is we've managed to establish an agreement with the authorities of, this, of these countries to uh, then translocate some of these individuals that come from wildlife rehabilitation centers, notably in Spain, to other countries to reintroduce uh, or, or restock these populations. So in the case of the scenarios vulture, but also of the griffin vulture, we don't really need to do captive breeding mm -hmm. because it is very expensive. Captive breeding is very expensive and technically quite difficult and very, uh, and very time consuming. And um, we can simply, uh, I mean, it also requires quite a lot of work, but we can simply establish an agreement with um, wildlife rehabilitation centers with the governments of these countries, ask for some birds, they give us the birds, we then translocate and we, we reintroduce in suitable habitat. With a birded vulture, but also with the Egyptian vulture, this is not possible because these species are still very rare. So the number of birds that enter um, wildlife rehabilitation centers per year is very small. It's one or two. So, you know, only one or two birded vultures are found in Europe every year, wounded or weakened, um, and enter a wildlife rehabilitation center. Now, you cannot do a reintroduction project with one or two birds a year. Uh, you, need to, you need to release quite a lot more if you are to be successful. So the only way with the birded vulture, the only way to reintroduce birds is to use the captive stock uh, that exists in zoos uh, and, uh, uh, you know, do captive breeding for introduction, promote breeding in captivity, and then reintroduce um, the young that, that come from, from, from captive breeding. But I think this is quite important to, um, you know, to, um, to convey that, uh, you know, uh, when reintroduction and restocking of vultures is really uh, an area of expertise uh, we, in which we, we've uh, specialized. Uh, we've been very successful at it, and we do it either with captive breeding, in the case of birded vulture, or using uh, wild origin birds that go through wildlife rehabilitation centers, in the case of the scenarios vulture and the, the griffin vulture. And here I, I emphasize the role of Spain. Spain uh, has got 90% um, of uh, the world's, uh, of Europe's, I'm sorry, 90% uh, of Europe's vultures. 
very very healthy populations it is um it is the um you know the 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 center of uh, european vulture distribution um and uh, uh, and therefore it's um uh, it, it is a key country for vultures in europe and it's a key country for the reintroduction uh, uh, of uh, projects uh, uh, across europe fortunately the spanish authorities and the spanish our spanish partners spanish ngos uh, have been engaging in these international efforts and playing their part so that um, their vultures eventually find you know uh, find a way to be to be reintroduced and restocked in other countries and and restore the European population as such, uh, and we are very grateful to to their uh, to their co collaboration. But yeah, impressive bird the scenarios vulture. It is so. So, what's the population of this vulture and the bearded vulture in Europe at the moment? So, the bearded vulture uh, now numbers around two hundred and fifty pairs. Um, we've uh, so the, the population of the of the Pyrenees. In Europe, uh, the, the population of the Pyrenees has increased from about uh, 40 pairs to about uh, 170. Uh, there's about uh, 50 to 60 pairs in the Alps where they were introduced, the birded vulture, and they are already breeding uh, also in Andalusia in southern Spain in one of our uh, other reintroduction projects. And then they still keep breeding in small numbers in Crete and Corsica. There's, so there's about 250 pairs of, of the birded vulture. Uh, in, in Europe. This one, uh, the population is uh, over 3,000 pairs, most of them in Spain, but as mentioned, uh, there's about 35 pairs in Portugal, recolonization, about 35 pairs as well in France uh, as a result of, of a successful reintroduction, and again, another 30 to 40 pairs in Greece, and the species is being now reintroduced in, uh, in, in the Balkans. Yeah. Right, and then that brings us on to the next one, which is sort of the most popular one in Europe, which is the griffin vulture. Exactly. Um, you know, there's, there's quite a few of these, uh, but there should be because they're a fantastic vulture. So do you want to tell us a bit about this one? Yes, I mean this is the this is the the, the commonest of our vultures, the griffin vulture. Um, there are now about 40,000 uh, 40, pairs across Europe. Uh, again, mostly in Spain. Spain uh, alone has got only thirty thousand pairs, and the population there has also increased over the last twenty to thirty years. Um, Socially gregarious, colonial, they breed in colonies uh, on cliffs. Uh, Cinereus vultures, by the way, the, the previous species are, are tree, uh, tree nesters. They build on, on you know, they build the, the, their nests on, on trees, on top of, of trees. These ones are, are cliff breeders. They, they, um, they, they build their nests on, on rock faces. Um, this is the, the, the most common. Uh, it's quite impressive as well. Um, they are also usually the first ones to arrive to a carcass. Um, uh, they, they've got a very powerful beak and um, they are the ones that usually that open a carcass. In fact, vultures in general uh, are what, what I call nature cleanup screw. They are really, um, you know, uh, uh, small machines made to uh, get rid of, of, of animal, dead animals, animal carcasses in the countryside. And they do it uh, extremely effectively and very, very fast. Um, and and the, most, the most amazing thing is that, of course, this is a result of evolution. They've, they've evolved um, in, in such a way that, that the four different species uh, don't compete with each other and they actually together uh, consume different parts of, 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 of the carcass. Um, and normally, uh, in, in a situation where these four species uh, coexist uh, in a certain place, you would go from a, you know, a, a dead cow or a dead sheep um, or a dead horse to uh, you know, almost nothing, even the bones are eaten in, in a question of, of, of a few hours. Uh, because the first species would, would, would go through this carcass very, very rapidly. The first one usually to arrive to the scene is this one, is the griffon vulture. They've got a very powerful beak and they even lost the feathers of their neck and, and head. And this is because these are the ones that usually um, uh, open the first the first holes in the carcass uh, so they use the beak and they use actually the natural 
um, you know, uh, perforations of, of, of an animal, uh, the eyes, the ears, the mouth, to actually start, uh, you know, eating the soft tissue and the inside of, of, of the carcasses. And because of this, um, they lost the feathers of the head or of the neck, because if they had feathers on the head of the neck, these would get dirty. Uh, very, very, uh, you know, very easily because of all the organic juices in the carcass. And then this, this probably would be a problem for the birds. So they lost this so that they can actually put their head inside the carcass and, and, and you know, and, and, it'll, and make, make it open and all that. So they, they, they arrive, they make it open. Then after these, the Cinerus vulture and the Egyptian vultures come and they start also eating you know muscular tissue and and bits and scraps and then in the end as mentioned when when there's almost no no other thing other than bones the the birded vulture would come and eat the bones as i mentioned so yeah so this species the most common uh, still relatively widespread lives across the mediterranean from spain portugal france uh, to to the balkans and and um, uh, uh, and then through to uh, to west uh, west uh, uh, asia um, we are, um, uh, it is the, the, the least threatened, threatened of, of, of the species. So in terms of priority, uh, it's the, the, the one with, with less priority for conservation actions. But very often uh, in a certain region, uh, we actually start working with these species um, because first of all, uh, it, it is the most abundant or, or very often the only one that, that still survives in, in, in a certain region. And, and by studying it and by working with it, we start um, to understand the threats and the context that exists in the area. Uh, which we will then use to um, uh, uh, then be a little bit more ambitious in terms of vulture conservation work with the, with, with the other species. So very often we use this as a proxy species for vulture conservation. So if, for example, if we want, and this, this actually happened, uh, we wanted to reintroduce um, the, the, the full guild of species back to Bulgaria. And we started with this one. We started to work with this one. Uh, there were very few left in Bulgaria, and we started to work with that. And we started to reintroduce uh, these species to, to some mountain ranges where it was not, uh, it didn't exist any longer. And through this, we got experience. We understood the, um, the context, the threats, and so on. We, uh, we established partnerships with local organizations, uh, we created uh, expertise, and then we moved, when, once we were confident that we, we, you know, we were in the right path, we then moved to reintroduce the Cineris Vulture, which we are currently doing. Uh, and then the next step, which we have not started, but we will do, is after the scenarios vulture introduction, we will reintroduce the birdie vulture, mm -hmm. uh, which of course is a much more technically difficult uh, project, and we have to be absolutely right that everything is, you know, is is ready in the country, and and have used the the, the griffon vulture first, and then the scenarios vulture. To, uh, to go up the ladder of, uh, of vulture restoration in a certain region and in a certain, uh, in, in a certain country. But yeah, uh, fascinating species. This is the species that you, you'll most likely encounter first. Very often, um, you know, dozens or even hundreds of them flying above you. If you go to the Pyrenees, uh, if you go to many places in Spain, if you go, if you go to southern France, uh, you can have easily 500 of these vultures uh, in the, in, uh, flying in the Gorge du Verdon, uh, in, the, in the canyons of Verdon or Cosse, or in the many canyons that exist in, in, in Spain. Uh, so, the, you know, if, um, uh, the, 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 this is the most likely vulture that you'll see, uh, you'll see, uh, you'll see for, first, the, the, the griffon vulture. Yeah, and then the, the griffin vulture on the IUCN red list is least concerned. The, the one we're coming to now is listed as endangered, um, which is the, the griffin vulture. Yes. Uh, which may surprise a few people. I mean, when I've been in Europe, I have seen Egyptian vultures more than I've seen other vultures. Um, so why is it in such trouble? Tell us a bit about it and why it's in such trouble. Yes, so this is this is in fact the only vulture in Europe that we are a little bit concerned with. As I mentioned, uh, vultures in Europe uh, are doing well. 
uh, and except for this one. And in fact, of, of the four species, this is the one that has got a global status, uh, uh, which, which uh, of some concern, it's it's actually globally uh, endangered at, at, at global level. And, and again, it's a species that, that occurs in uh, Europe, mostly Europe, Eurasia, with some in the Middle East and, and, and very few in, uh, in, in, in Africa. Um, it, um, uh, it has got also, I mean, the population in Europe is about 3,000 pairs. Uh, so, you know, uh, uh, again, uh, and, and is still, and this is really significant, is still declining. Not, not all over Europe. Fortunately, we are starting to see some populations starting to increase or at least stabilized. But in many areas of Europe, is still declining. Um, uh, and 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 that therefore the endangered status and therefore uh, the fact that we are that we are worried with with this vulture. Why is it still declining and why is it rare? Um, well, it is um, uh, well two reasons. Um, it is possibly the most um, eclectic uh, species. It's very adaptable. It's very flexible. It eats lots of different things, big animals, small animals. It can even eat some live prey, some small lizards or small mice. Um, and, and therefore, for example, it might be more prone for uh, poisoning with anticoagulant, um, uh, raticide, uh, you know, uh, poison that is put against rats or against uh, rodents in farms. Another reason why it might be still um, uh, declining is that unlike the other three species, which are mostly sedentary, um, this means that they spend most of the year in Europe, uh, may, some of them, of the other three species, do large movements. They fly and, you know, they disperse widely, but they are not, but they, 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 they these dispersion movements are usually within the continent. Mm -hmm. These species, is mostly migratory. Uh, this means that it spends their winters, its winters in Africa. Africa south of, 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 of the Sahara Desert is like our, our swallows uh, yeah. or, or our white storks. They spend summer in Europe and then they fly thousands of kilometers to spend the winter in Africa. Now, um, this migration, uh, this migration movement is extremely um, uh, uh, dangerous. Uh, you know, there's, a, there's maybe an added mortality uh, due to migration. Um, and um, and therefore, this might also explain why well why this species is the only European vulture species that is declining. The other three are are, are doing uh, are doing very well. We are worried with it. Um, in particular, the Balkan population is declining very fast. Uh, once upon a time, hundreds of vultures, uh, hundreds of pairs of, of Egyptian vultures bred in the Balkans. There are now only about forty pairs of uh, Egyptian vultures um, left in the Balkans, in Bulgaria, in Greece, in North Macedonia and Albania, and is still declining. Um, uh, and we may see a regional extinction and we, it, may be, it may be needed for us to reintroduce it uh, in maybe 40 years time or 30 years time. We are trying not to lose it now. Um, and there's a lot of projects with Egyptian vulture going on in, uh, in Southeastern, um, uh, Southeastern Europe. But yeah, um, a very interesting species. Um, uh, uh, it, for example, eats a lot of eggs, um, and in fact, um, it uh, uh, in Africa uh, uses stones to break uh, the uh, large, huge ostrich eggs. Um, so it's one of the few few animal species, or uh, certainly one of the few bird species, that actually uses uh, tools uh, for feeding. So it, it, it because you know ostrich eggs are, are large and, and, and right, quite thick, and sometimes with the beak they are it's not enough to break them. So they use these uh, these stones to the, they throw stones to um, uh, to break these um, uh, these uh, uh, these, uh, these eggs. Um, the, the yellow face that you see in the picture here, it comes from some, um, uh, some pigments uh, that uh, exist in the feces of animals, because this, uh, this animal also eats uh, parts of feces, and certainly it's the insects that feed on the feces of cows. Um, so it is uh, very often associated with, with livestock um, uh, explorations in, in Europe. Um, and it might also suffer because of that, because as you know, uh, 
uh, livestock farming in Europe these days is very intensified. There's a lot of uh, veterinary medicines, and it may be that uh, that is also causing an impact on um, on the Egyptian vulture. So this is the species to watch. This is the species that we are worried about. The overall scene of vultures in Europe is extremely successful and positive, and we are seeing increases, except with this guy, the Egyptian vulture. Uh, and we are very we are investing a lot of effort uh, and time to try to to to, to conserve them and um, and eventually to revert uh, the the decline that is still happening in many European regions. Right. So so you've mentioned you've touched on uh, sort of quite a few of the uh, threats as you've been talking about the individual species, so poisoning, etc. Um, so. If you take poisoning out of the equation, what are the other major threats to the vultures that are in Europe? Yes. So, uh, yeah, that's that's a very important question, uh, and it's a question that we uh, we we. we pretty much know uh, and are confident that we know what, what what is killing the vultures because a lot of work has been uh, has been done into you know in, into studying their ecology and so on quite a lot of the vultures have been tagged with gps tags we can follow them so we know why they die and where they die and we can investigate that so poison is without any, any doubt the number one killer this poison is not directed at vultures, as I mentioned. Yeah. Uh, farmers and hunters want to kill the wolf or the leopard or the lion or the fox. Um, and they uh, they use, uh, um, the, the, well, they inevitably kill vultures, which then feed on the poisoned meat that is left for these predators. Now, poisoning is illegal. Poisoning of wildlife is illegal. Um, that was not the case 50 years ago. 50 years ago was considered as a, a legitimate uh, wildlife uh, control method, but today is illegal, uh, in, in certainly in Europe, um, but unfortunately it's still a tradition, it's still relatively easy, it's very dangerous, you can kill people with, with, uh, with, uh, with poison, but, but it's still, it still, it still kills vultures, it kills red kites, it kills eagles, it kills buzzards uh, all over Europe, including the UK. Unfortunately, still are so very much used. For example, in grouse, you know, in grouse, uh, uh, in some grouse estates, badly managed grouse estates, to control uh, predators and therefore um, uh, uh, wildlife is, is killed. But I mean, let alone poison. The, the other uh, threats to vultures is collision and electrocution. Uh, against uh, usually the the energy infrastructure, so you know electricity lines, um, which crisscross our continent. There are hundreds of thousands of kilometers of electricity lines. You know, medium tension, high tension, and in you know across mountains, across valleys, and so on. And in poor weather, um, birds can collide against them and then break the wing. Uh, they can collide against wind farms, uh, uh, the windmills, uh, and, and some. If they are badly placed, uh, uh, birds can collide against the windmills, and also they can get electrocuted because uh, these vultures very often perch on, and in, in this case, is medium tension electricity poles. And if these medium tension electricity poles are badly designed, and if the um, uh, you know, if they touch uh, the two uh, the two wires at the same time as they are perched on the on the pole, which then connects them to the earth, there is an electrocution, and quite a lot of these birds uh, get killed, uh, get electrocuted this way. This is actually um, a, a very important source of mortality for the Egyptian vulture, as it is for the griffon vulture, uh, which are maybe the two species that uh, tend to perch more on these uh, on these uh, uh, poles. Other than that. Um, uh, three other uh, three other threats: direct persecution. Uh, it, it, it's you know it, it's amazing, uh, it's incredible, uh, but unfortunately there are still people that shoot at these birds. Uh, this was of course much more common uh, 50 years ago, uh, where raptors were persecuted and everybody shot raptors. And you know one would think that in this day and age, 21st century in Europe, you know uh, people. Now uh, they've got some environmental sensitivity to to avoid the, uh, destroying protected species, but unfortunately, what we find is that uh, you know birded vultures that we've reintroduced in France, they 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 get shot at, they get killed. We had we had one only two two months ago, a bird that we reintroduced in spring, was was shot by some 
hunter. Uh, well, I would not call uh, this person a hunter. I would call this person a killer because what he did was not hunting. Hunting is a perfect legitimate um, uh, activity that if done properly uh, in a regulated way should have no impact on biodiversity. What this person has done is killed um, a protected and very rare species. Is a killer, a killer of biodiversity, uh, uh, and and this is not the an isolated case. We still get griffin vultures, Egyptian vultures shot at. Some countries and some areas are, are worse than others. The Middle East is notoriously bad for persecution, direct persecution, people with guns shooting at, at everything. Then other threats, uh, important threats, um, lead. This is also associated with, uh, with hunting, in fact. Lead is a metal that is toxic to humans and toxic to animals. Uh, if we ingest a lot of lead, uh, we and the animals uh, can get uh, poisoned to death uh, or have so, you know, so, so, subacute uh, symptoms. Now, uh, we know this for, for many years and we, uh, we have actually uh, eliminated lead from most uh, uh, things. We've eliminated lead from uh, the paint in our houses. We've eliminated lead from the petrol in our cars, but we have not eliminated lead from hunting ammunition. And what happens is when hunters use hunting ammunition and they kill a chamois, uh, and then they leave part of the chamois in the mountains, or if the chamois escapes and goes and, and dies somewhere else, and then the vultures come and, and, and um, and eat the chamois, they ingest the, the lead ammunition and, uh, and then they get poisoned with, with, with lead. So what we've been doing is we've been lobbying the European Union um, uh, and, and governments uh, to basically ban uh, lead from uh, handing ammunition. There are alternatives. You can make uh, copper bullets. You can make bullets made of different, you know, different metals. Uh, it does not need, need to be lead. Uh, it's a question of market. It's a question of profit. Um, uh, fortunately, we are going in the right direction. Uh, just just a month ago, the European Union has banned um, lead shot uh, to in 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 uh, to to be used in while hunting in wetlands. So in, uh, in the next few, in the next couple of years, uh, all hunting done in, in wetlands across the European Union cannot use lead shot, the little pellets that are often used to, to kill ducks. Now we are, uh, a process has started to actually also ban lead bullets from uh, hunting in terrestrial habitats, uh, big game hunting. Um, and we hope that in a few years time, we will go the same way and we will ban lead from hunting ammunition. But at the moment is still killing vultures and is still killing other, other wildlife like golden eagles and, and so on. And finally, um, another uh, important threat uh, or at least potential threat is veterinary medicines. Uh, veterinary medicines that are given to cattle that then uh, uh, vultures feed on. In particular, one uh, veterinary medicine that is very worrying to us, which is the clofenac. Uh, the same one that actually killed 99% of Asian vultures, and that unfortunately still uh, or appeared in Europe in the, in, in the in the last few years. Oh, right now, now we were very worried about it, so we've asked the European Union to ban it. Plenty of evidence; uh, they've accepted that this is indeed worrying and uh, and that it is a risk to vultures. Um, uh, what what happened? is that the European Union has put a very strict rules on the usage of this veterinary medicine. Uh, this veterinary medicine needs to be used uh, only with the veterinary prescription and administered in very special uh, circumstances, uh, precisely um, to prevent uh, the, the carcasses treated with this veterinary medicine to die outside and be available to vultures. And what the European Union and the, and the governments have told us is that they believe that these measures that were, that were put in place are sufficient to prevent this veterinary medicine entering the vulture food chain. Uh, they also told us though, that should we pick up mortality uh, of vultures due to this veterinary medicine, they would be, uh, they would be ready to uh, revert this situation and eventually ban the veterinary medicine. So what we've been doing these days is we've actually been looking very, very closely to dead vultures and try to identify uh, uh, the, you know, the source of mortality 
and doing analysis for this veterinary medicine. Uh, and if we find, uh, or if we start to find vultures uh, in Spain, for example, dead with, uh, with veterinary diclofenac, we will then, then ask the European Union and the Spanish government to ban the, the sale of this uh, uh, of this product. Uh, so yeah, a potential threat. Uh, to date, we have we do not have evidence that um, this veterinary medicine has killed vultures in Europe. Unlike what happened in our, in Asia, where it's it's widespread use without any control became so so you know widespread that actually killed all the vultures. Uh, but it is it is something that worries us and that we will keep uh, uh, keep monitoring. Yeah, and it's worth saying that um, I think I'm right in saying that the drug has now been um, banned in some of the Asian countries. And yes, was, you know, absolutely. So because of this decline, 99% decline, uh, conservation organizations like the RSPB, uh, the Peregrine Fund and others lobbied hard for, for, for the the, the veterinary that veterinary medicine to be banned. And uh, fortunately, the governments of India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, uh, uh, banned the sale of, 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 of veterinary diclofenac in the country. It came a little bit too late in the sense that the decline had already happened, but at least, uh, you know, it's not causing mortality any longer. Um, and uh, uh, hopefully we will see a very slow recovery of vulture populations there. But yeah, something something for us to keep a, a, an eye on. But yeah, poison, electrocution and collision, um, direct persecution, um, and uh, and lead are uh, the four main uh, mortality uh, causes of, of vultures uh, in Europe. Right. Just before we move on to talk a little bit more about uh, the FCs, work, a quick question about wind turbines, because wind turbines, it's a relatively new industry. Um, but you say that the, the it's, you know, there are collisions and I've, I've seen firsthand that there are other collisions with other birds as well. Given that it's such a sort of young industry, is there nothing that can be done at this stage that will eradicate these collisions? Because this, it's still an industry that's learning, it's still growing. Can they not do something at this point that will make them safer for birds going forward? Well, the, the solution there and the key word there is planning, is proper planning. <laughs> Uh, I mean, we as conservationists, we cannot be against wind turbines uh, because uh, there is this other uh, very imminent threat upon us, which is the climate change threat. Yeah. And, and wind turbines, renewable energy is is the answer to that. Uh, and therefore, you know, we, we cannot we cannot say, oh, we should you know we shouldn't have wind turbines because because then <laughs> we have climate change. It is really a question of proper planning. Um, uh, uh, wind turbines are fine as long as they are placed in, in, in sites which do not pose any threat to biodiversity. Um, and there are many sites across across Europe where, 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 where the mortality uh, it would probably be minimal uh, and have, have no impact. However, there are some sites, migratory fly, you know, flyways, migratory bottlenecks, top of the mountain, some ridges, <laughs> some, <coughs> some uh, <clears throat> coastal areas where um, a badly placed wind turbine can actually have got a devastating impact <clears throat> on, um, on, on biodiversity, including, including vultures. And there are wind turbines that, that can actually you know, uh, have an impact on the demography of, of, of some raptor species, including, including vultures. Mm -hmm. So the question there is for the industry and the planners and the conservationists to sit together to do some, uh, you know, some sensitivity mapping and say, look, you know, we can have wind turbines, maybe not everywhere. Um, now, um, what happens to the ones that are already built? Because some of them are already built. Um, there are some solutions uh, that minimize uh, that minimize uh, uh, impact. Uh, very recently, for example, there was a, a very promising paper that showed that painting the blades uh, black and white. Uh, reduced mortality of white-tailed sea eagles in a couple of sites in Scandinavia uh, significantly. So maybe you know, maybe maybe a question of color could 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 uh, work. But I can also tell you that I know um, I know one particular example extremely well. It's a it's a wind turbine. It's a wind farm, a very large wind farm in Portugal, in a migratory bottleneck where thousands of raptors fly through twice a year. 
uh, it's a very windy place as well, um, and the 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 wind uh, the wind uh, permit uh, was given only in the condition that a very thorough monitor is done, and when birds are present. Uh, uh, the, the wind farm is shut down. It's what's called in, in the industry shut down on demand. Now, this might seem uh, scary for the industry and say, oh, you know, why, why should we do this? Because we will lose business. But what happens is, what happen is the, you know, the, the, they develop methods uh, and an and analysis of the pattern of movement of birds uh, that actually uh, uh, meant that in, um, you know, having people on the ground watching uh, the uh, the movement of birds for some periods of the year when the birds pass through uh, and actually shutting them down when there is immediate danger of, of collision, reduce mortality to almost zero. In several years, uh, uh, there were only two or three birds that got killed in absolute terms. And there, there's, there's tens, hundreds of thousands of birds that pass through in, 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 in all, all those, those years. Uh, and this has almost didn't, uh, didn't really have an impact on the economic profitability of the wind farm because the periods of shutdown on demand were, were very small. So there are win-win solutions. There are win-win solutions that the industry and conservationists can promote and can find if there is goodwill and, and, and if there's communication between, uh, between the, the, um, uh, the two sides. But mostly it's, it's planning and making sure that they are not built in the first place in these, in these priority sites. Sure, sure. Thank you for that. So now we'll talk a little bit about um, your work, VCF's work. Um, I've taken these from your website. And again, if you don't subscribe to the newsletter, you really should because this is the type of quality you get. Really, really interesting um, articles on some of your release schemes. So you, you've mentioned sort of re-release. What else are you doing to support vulture conservation? Well, I mean, uh, so as mentioned, captive breeding, and these are images from captive breeding of birded vultures. Uh, now, captive breeding, um, and you know, my colleague there, Alex Lopez, he is the world's um, you know uh, expert on captive breeding of birded vultures. Uh, he has worked on, on on this for twenty or thirty years. He knows all the secrets. He himself developed, of course, you know, twenty or thirty years ago, we did, we did, we had no clue. Uh, you know what, what to do with, with, with captive breeding of these species and it was his work and, and work of his colleagues that single-handedly developed the protocols uh, and so on that we use today to have some so so good results in in, in captive breeding i have to tell you that um we don't hand rear uh, birds um, uh, because we do captive breeding for reintroduction. Uh, we don't want, uh, and, and, and these birds need to be as wild as possible. They, they need to react to their, to their species and not to humans. You know that uh, if you hand rear a bird, an eagle or a sparrow, it doesn't matter, the bird will imprint on you. At some point, it will think that you are um, the same species and will look at you as a, 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 a conspecific. And therefore, what happens if you release birds that are uh, hand reared is that the birds will immediately fly to the next to the next human. Uh, because they think that the next human is the same species as uh, as the bird, because there was that imprinting at some point. We know, for example, that in birded vultures, that period um, kicks uh, uh, in after seven days, when the chick is seven days old, approximately seven days old. So for the first seven days, you can and rear a bird. Uh, for the first seven days, in the case of the birded vulture, it depends on the species, but in the birded vulture, for the first seven days, you can hand rear a bird. After seven days, if you don't want them to imprint on humans, you need to let a, a, an adult birded vulture feed. What we do in the case of the birded vulture to maximize production is, you know that birded vultures, um, they produce two eggs in the wild, uh, but only one chick survives, and this is this is uh, this is absolute. We do not know any case in you know in all this history in years of of birded vulture watching of a nest with two chicks, and this is because the older chick always kills the younger chick. 
in in a, in, our, in, a, in a phenomenon called Cainism, and this is an, again an evolution um, for uh, an environment where food is usually scarce, and usually so it's better to have only one chick which is properly fed rather than two chicks which are not so well fed. Yeah. Um, so and this you know this is now innate behavior, and this always happens. So uh, of course what happens in captive breeding is that this is a waste because you've got two perfectly good eggs with two embryos and only one of them would survive. So what we do is we take one of the eggs, we, we put it in an artificial incubator um, and then we hand rear it for six days. And that's what my colleague there is doing uh, in, the, in the picture. But then on the seventh day, we need to give it back to a parent. And what we do is we usually give it back to a parent, uh, to, to a, a wild bird, to a, not a wild bird, to an adult bird that, uh, that uh, lost, uh, uh, lost the, uh, the egg or the chick and became a foster adoptive parent. But this requires, of course, very close, close management and intensive management of our captive bred stock. We now uh, manage about close to 200 birds in captivity, uh, which are, um, you know, that live in specialized breeding centers, some of which the VCF manages, uh, but also uh, they are also distributed among quite a few zoos, which, um, uh, which then follow our guidelines and collaborate very actively with, um, with us. So this is captive breeding of, of birded vulture, uh, and it has been very successful. We, we raise uh, about uh, 30 birds a year, of which we release about 25. Um, and what we do is uh, we then, when they are about two months old, so a few weeks before, um, before fledging, uh, so about the age of that bird there on the on the screen, the, the big bird on the screen, we take it to an, a natural nest in the mountains. Uh, the, that bird there, it's about maybe two months, cannot fly yet. It still still takes a few weeks to, to do its first flight. It has been reared by um, a captive uh, a parent. Uh, then we take it there and we leave it on a platform. But of course, we need to we need to feed it, but we don't feed it uh, manually because if we because we want to avoid him having contact with humans. So what we do is, you know, either we throw the food or we we, we put the food there at night when the bird does not see us. But usually we throw the food from the top of the cliff through, a, a, you know, a, some sort of a. Um, uh, a channel that that delivers the food to to the base of the cliff where where the bird is, and during those two or three weeks where the bird is in that nest before the flight, they somehow acquire some uh, like this a picture exactly. So these are two birds that have put been put in a nest in the mountains. Uh, they are being fed, uh, you know, from a, a a tube on the top of the mountain, and then during those two or three final weeks in which they are there they will acquire a certain familiarity with the, that mountain and normally return to that mountain to breed. Um, this method is called hacking. Uh, it's used for vultures, but it's also used for other raptors. And it's, uh, it's, uh, it's used in our interaction projects because we, what we want is uh, after these birds fledge, eventually that they stay in the area. Uh, and that they breed uh, in, 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 those, uh, in, in those mountains. So we do a lot of this. We, are, we now have got um, five reintroduction projects. I, I told you that we started in the Alps. We then went to Andalusia, to Gran Cos in southern... Just answer the door. I won't be sad. Keep talking. <laughs> Yes, so we we started uh, in in the Alps. We uh, we are do doing it in Andalusia, in southern Spain. We are doing we are doing it in Gran Cos, uh, a mountain chain in between the Alps and the Pyrenees. We've started also in an, a mountain chain called Maestrazgo in Spain, um, and we will be doing it in the Balkans uh, very very soon. So we, we are doing it in or, or, you know across across Europe. But apart from reintroduction, captive reading and reintroduction. We do a lot of uh, conservation work. Um, so anti-poisoning projects that fight poisoning, working with the police, uh, working with uh, the enforcement agents, with the toxicological labs, identifying uh, eventually uh, instances of poisoning, working with the judiciary 
factory for them to be persecuted. We work with electricity companies to mitigate the threat of electrocution and collision. Electrocution is relatively simple. You just have to isolate uh, the cables in some uh, problematic poles. In the case of collision, you can put some bird diverters, bird flappers, yeah. on lines so that at least they've got a little bit more uh, visibility and, and 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 reduce the risk of of collision we we work with the with the hunting sector to eliminate lead from um, uh, hunting ammunition uh, we do a lot of information and awareness campaigns uh, so that people respect vultures they don't shoot at vultures and they understand uh, that the, their importance we work with livestock breeders so that they also understand their importance and actually they promote uh, you know the partial abandonment of carcasses uh, where vultures exist so that they are consumed by by vultures in a win-win situation so a lot of conservation work apart from captive breeding and reintroduction yeah sure and how are you finding because you, you mentioned earlier about um sort of farmers and hunters and sort of cultures uh how do you um how do you go about not educating educating is the wrong word but working with local citizens that where you're where you, you've got a release program where in the past there might have been a misunderstanding about vultures and there might have been hunting and there might have been poison how do you go about doing that education process? Well, usually by showing, by, by inviting them, by taking them to, to places for them to see vultures. Uh, because, you know, because many places vultures disappeared 50 years ago and they are now reappearing, uh, the, the recent generation doesn't really know about them. They, yeah. they, don't, they don't know that they've actually um, eat dead carcasses. And in fact, uh, this, is a, this is a big problem that we have. The, the, there are lots of people and lots of farmers particularly young farmers that think that vultures kill their cattle uh, because it, it, it is a normal association. You know, one day you see um, a, a sick sheep uh, in your field. The next day you see 10 vultures over a dead sheep in your field. And therefore you say, oh, the vultures killed my sheep and they are eating my sheep. Well, what happened was the sheep, the, 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 the sheep was sick, died, and then the vultures came and obviously are doing what they do do best, eat a dead carcass. Um, but yeah, a lot of communication with, um, with, with, uh, with farmers. I mean, I can give you several examples. Very often we've got members of the public, for example, now that vultures are, are relatively common, members of the public in the Pyrenees, uh, hikers, they, they stumble across uh, a group of vultures on the ground. And this means that they, they were probably feeding. There was some sort of a, of, of a dead animal there. Uh, and they stumble across a group of vultures on the ground and whatever. These are, uh, vultures are very heavy birds. They don't fly very well. They need uh, warm currents to lift them. So what happens is when you stumble about a group of birds, the birds try to lift off, but it takes some time. And therefore they are circling, trying to pick up altitude above you. And uh, we've had people telling us, they wanted to, to attack us because they were all around us. They were, they, were, they were flying all around us. They wanted to attack us. And, you know, it, and we said, no, look, uh, you startle them. They take time to, to actually, they, they wanted to escape from you. They take time. And, 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 and the circling above you is actually what they need to do in order to, to, to lift off and, and gain altitude and, 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 and disappear. So we, we, we have got lots of, of the, these stories more and more because fortunately vultures are becoming, uh, becoming more, um, more common in, um, uh, in, in Europe. But, uh, but yeah, it's a question of communication and hence uh, we pay a lot of attention to our website and to our stories and you've said it and, and and thank you for that i really encourage people to try to follow our website because then they can read lots of different stories about about vultures and through it learn a little bit more about um, about them and, and and start appreciating them rather than uh, you know rather than uh, just loathe them or or be uh, be neutral to them yeah yeah sure so We've talked about lead and that there's, I mean, there's a step forward with lead being banned in wetland areas. We've talked about uh, a medication that's been banned in Asia. Um, how optimistic are you for the future of vultures? Well, I'm optimistic about the future of European vultures. The track record, our track record has been very good. 
uh, and, and, and the stories are mostly positive. Um, and, and through it, I want to believe that uh, the same thing can happen in Asia and in Africa. And in fact, we are engaging more and more with our African colleagues, for example, in the fight against poisoning, which is killing all the all their vultures, so that they eventually try to replicate um, some of the, the tools that we've used in Europe uh, to revert the situation in, in Africa. Um, there are, though, a few things that a few conditions. Um, in fact, I think that um, I think that there, there are three three main conditions, uh, three or four main conditions that need that need to happen uh, for us to have this positive story. One of them is is funding. Um, we need we need some we need some money. Uh, uh, you know we, we need money to to restore populations and to conserve populations. Now this money um, is is peanuts as the world economy goes. But it is still significant. Some some millions of euros have been spent in Europe on vulture conservation, uh, and you know, and that that made a difference. So we need uh, we need governments, we need multilateral organizations, we need companies, we need individuals to say, well, vultures are important. I will I will donate. I will dedicate a certain amount of my budget of my country's budget to vulture conservation. The second thing we need is we need very good we, we need good legislation. Uh, we need legislation that allows, for example, partial abandonment of carcasses in the field. Uh, we need legislation that protects vultures, that makes poisoning illegal, and legislation that is properly implemented. And I have to say that in Europe, I know that uh, the UK has just been through a very traumatic period of Brexit, and you are not in the European Union any longer. Yeah, but the, yeah. European Union in, the European Union, in fact, has got some of the best uh, nature conservation legislation anywhere in the world. The birds and habitats directives uh, are, are very, very good. And, and, and that is very important. I think the third thing that we need is um, we need the good science. We need the um, uh, good research and scientists uh, that uh, uh, monitor and study vultures and that produce uh, um, data and solutions that underpin conservation efforts. So, you know, uh, uh, we very often need answers and we say, well, we've got this problem, we want to reduce mortality, give us a solution. And, and, and I think it's very good to have universities and researchers working alongside us to provide with those solutions. And finally, we need, we need people engaged and people from governments to farmers. And this is through communications. So, you know, through, through an initiatives like yours, for example, your, your, your channel, uh, which spreads the word and which informs audiences. This is very important because if each one of us uh, is aware about vultures, um, maybe we can influence somebody which is a local authority or a national authority or in government or an, or, or a, an MP, and maybe something good uh, happens out of, out of it. So I think these, these four conditions, money, legislation, science, and um, information and, and engagement uh, from individual to inst institutions are really key for, for, for Vulture. But I mean, I'm, I'm optimist, I'm optimist. We, we do need to be vigilant though. Yes. Because, uh, you know, if the Klofenac, for example, uh, does enter the Vulture food chain in Europe, we can have a 99% decline uh, like it happened in Asia. Yeah. And all the good work that has been done in the last 30 years can go down the drain in a few years time. Yeah. Or if, uh, uh, you know, for some reason, we are, very, for example, very worried about, about the wolf. The wolf has, re has, has, has recolonized many parts of Europe. Uh, it's a species that is very adaptable. So we, you know, it is now spreading all over Germany, all over France, uh, in many areas of Central Europe. Um, and the wolf is still creating quite a lot of human wildlife conflict. Um, and we are starting to see in some of those areas, farmers using poison again. Things that they, they didn't use, they're using poison again to solve a problem with the wolf. And of, unfortunately, vultures are getting killed. So for example, in the Alps where poison was completely non-existent. In the last uh, couple of years, we started, to, we, we had two, two birded vultures uh, found dead because of poisoning. And that is usually associated with, with wolf. So we need to remain vigilant, but I'm optimist. I'm optimist that we can do better in Europe and that we can do certainly better in the world, certainly in Africa and in Asia. Excellent. Well, long may it continue and well done because the work you're doing is amazing. 
Um, so thank you for doing that work to you and your colleagues. And thank you very much for your time today. Um, hopefully we can get the message out and people will start loving vultures because I think what people don't realize is they, you know, think, right, okay, so vultures go and they clear up the meat, uh, you know, and the, and the, the carcasses. Um, what they don't realize is, is you know, that the secondary um, benefits to them doing that, you know, is reduction in rabies, you know, there's bacterial elements that they're clearing up. So, you know, vultures are a, a necessary species. They're not just a nice species, they're necessary species. So it's great that you're doing the work that you're doing. Thank you. Thank you for your interest and for your time and uh, all the best and, um, and have a good year. Uh, well, yeah, I hope to. If they ever let me out to play. All the best. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Yeah,